In the previous talk, we found out about frequency response functions. We looked at the frequency response of a single mode. And then I said a little bit about how you would measure the frequency response of instruments like the ones we've been seeing in these introductory pictures all the time. But I then stopped. I showed you one example of the response function of a violin, but didn't say anything about it. In this talk, I'm going to give a little bit of information about the anatomy of that measurement. The first thing we have to understand is why this frequency response is relevant. Uh, in particular, the measurement of the bridge of the instrument. And the key thing to understand is that all stringed instruments work in roughly the same way. The player spends all their time making the string vibrate in some particular way. The string of course is under tension. So at the bridge of the instrument, as the string vibrates, the tension pulls a little bit upwards and a little bit downwards in the way that I've plotted it here. So, um, so of course the string vibration might not be in the plane of this diagram, this is purely schematic. But the string tension pulls a little bit this way and a little bit that way. So as well as the steady component of the tension that produces static forces on the instrument, there's a vibrating component of the tension which is perpendicular to the string in the plane of the bridge. And it's that vibrating force at the string notch in the bridge which drives the instrument into vibration. Now, why do we need the instrument body in the first place? Well, that's because of something we learned right back in the first talk. Remember, we talked about wavelengths of sound in air. And what we found were these two numbers that at the limits of human hearing, the wavelength of sound varies from 17 meters down to 17 millimeters. But even 17 millimeters is much, much bigger than the diameter of a typical musical string, which is more like one millimeter. And for reasons that we'll meet in the next talk, what that means is that a vibrating string is a very bad way to radiate sound into the air. The string is simply too thin compared with the wavelength. The air just flows around the vibrating string. It doesn't get compressed into pressure waves, which are sound. As someone had said, trying to make sound by vibrating a string is a bit like trying to fan yourself with a toothpick. It's just too small. So that's why instruments need bodies, uh, assuming they're acoustic instruments rather than electric instruments. And it's that vibrating force at the bridge of the instrument, which then is transferred through and makes the instrument body vibrate in some way. And the whole point of the body of an instrument is that it's not small compared to the wavelengths of sound. So you can't have an instrument body that's too small. A matchbox sized violin would not sound good and I'm sure you intuitively know that a matchbox sound sized violin would sound pretty thin and tinny. So you've, by transferring this force through the bridge, making the body vibrate, the vibrations of the body can manage to excite sound waves in the air and lo, you can hear your instrument being played. So as instrument makers, you're interested in exactly how that body vibrates. Different violins, different guitars will vibrate in subtly different ways and that is responsible for the differences of sound between those instruments. And this is where this frequency response function comes in. Now here's a slide that you saw in the last talk. This is a measurement at the bridge of a violin or at the bridge of a banjo here, much the same measurement. And this is characterizing how the body vibrates at the point that's relevant to the to the vibrating string. It's at the string notch in the bridge. And here's another slide we saw last time. This is the kind of result you get 
by doing that measurement on a violin in this case and that tells us something about the particular violin here and that's what we're going to talk about. First stage, one more slide from the previous talk. This is what the frequency response looks like for a single node. It has a peak at the resonant frequency. How high and narrow that peak is depends on the damping characterized by this thing called the Q factor, if you remember. Um, for what it's worth, the typical Q factors for a violin body mode would be most like the blue curve here. Something around about a Q factor of 30 would be typical. So one mode of a violin might produce a peak rather like this in our frequency response. So here's our actual frequency response and we can see various peaks and at low frequency we can indeed associate those peaks with individual modes. Now here is something else that you saw in a previous talk. These are measured vibration modes of a violin body. They're not actually the same one as this admittance measurement but all violins have modes that look rather like these and these do indeed correspond to individual peaks at low frequency. Sometimes these are called signature modes. In the violin world these have jargon associated with them, these things are called CBR and B1- minus and B1+. Plus. That's a story for another day. So at low frequency the frequency response gives you peaks and those peaks are associated with the vibration modes of the instrument. But at high frequency things are more complicated and the reason they're more complicated is to do with this damping effect. Now when we looked at the frequency response of a single mode we saw that the height of the peak and also the bandwidth of the peak depended on the damping. There's always some damping so all these peaks have some finite width. Now as you go up in frequency you get more and more and more modes and on average for something like an instrument body the spacing of those will be roughly equal. You'll have roughly the same number of modes in each 500 hertz band, shall we say. But the bandwidth due to damping doesn't stay the same. As a first guess, the bandwidth due to damping goes up in proportion to the center frequency of the mode. So what that means is that when you get to high frequencies, the mode spacing stays roughly the same, but the bandwidth gets bigger. Or if we plot it on this logarithmic frequency scale, the peaks get closer together, but the apparent bandwidth stays the same. They're two versions of the same thing. What that means is that sooner or later the peaks start to overlap from individual modes. And what that then means is that when we see a single peak like this one, in the frequency response. Now that does not necessarily correspond to a single mode of the violin. There may be several modes with resonant frequencies within range of their damping bandwidth and this is a combination of various different modes. But we can see something else in this picture which is highlighted by this dashed blue line that I've drawn through it. There's a lot of fuzzy little up and down peaks but underneath that there's a rather broad structure of the whole thing going through a rise and I'm going to call that a formant. Now what is a formant? I've purloined the description from something that people use when they're describing speaking or singing. Now when you sing a melody think about it, you can sing the same vowel sound, R, U, E, you can sing that at different pitches and on a good day the listener will be able to tell both things. They'll be able to tell what pitch you're singing and which vowel you're singing. So how is that done? And it's done by something which is shown in this schematic diagram here. This will turn into an animation in a moment once I've talked through it. 
Now, you make noises deep down in your throat at your vocal cords, but by the time those get to the outside world through your mouth, they've gone through your vocal tract. You've got all sorts of tubes and, and you, you can change the shape of that vocal tract by moving your tongue, moving your lips and so on. And of course that is how you shape different vowel sounds. You put your tongues and your lips in different places. So that vocal tract has resonances. It's a sort of acoustic duct. But they're very broad resonances because they've got rather high damping because the walls of that your vocal tract are made of soft tissue. They're not hard walls uh, like a plaster cast of your vocal tract. They're soft and that has the results that the resonances of your vocal tract might look like this dashed black line. This is a schematic indication so it's showing a couple of resonances rather broad. The red lines are the harmonics of the note that you're singing. Now what, I'm going to run the animation here and what the animation will show is how those red lines change as the singer sings a chromatic scale going up one octave starting at the note you have here and ending up an octave higher. Now if you look at that or you freeze that video at any stage what you can see is that the red lines, the, the, there are just about enough of them that they kind of dot out the black dashed line. They're not showing this lowest one very well by this highest note here. But for each semitone, let me run the video again, every note you sing the red lines, the heights of the red lines will always dot out that curve. And that's what the listener's brain is using. They're hearing the frequencies of these harmonics to tell you what pitch is being sung, but they're also looking at the shape that's dotted out by the amplitudes to say what the singer has done with their vocal tract and therefore to tell them which vowel is being sung. You sing a different vowel, you move the black dashed line and the, the red uh, lines would dot out that new curve and tell you that you're ringing, singing a different vowel sound. So the result is that you get the, the sound of a singing voice has a lot of narrow peaks from the red lines dotting out a structure which is like this hump here and that generically is the same thing that's being done here. We've got lots of little peaks but they're marking out an underlying structure in the behaviour. In this particular case this is a violin and this is a feature often called the bridge hill and it's another story to say exactly how that works but as you can guess from the name it's got something to do with the bridge it's rather complicated but if we sum things up uh, from this talk you'll see roughly why that is something that instrument makers might be interested in so what we've learned in this talk and previous ones the body response of any stringed instrument can be characterized by measuring this frequency response function at the bridge. You look at that and say okay what is that telling us? At very low frequencies then the individual signature modes of the violin body or guitar body or whatever give you identifiable isolated peaks. But at higher frequencies things are more complicated but sometimes and in the violin was an example we saw those peaks can combine to map out these things called formants. Both those things are important to the sound of an instrument. The low frequency signature modes and the higher frequency formants. And the important thing to a maker is that these are the features that an instrument maker can manipulate. So what do they depend on? Well the signature modes 
depend on what kind of instrument it is. They'll be uh, different for a violin from a guitar, for example. We saw modes of, of violins and guitars earlier. If we focus in just on different violins, then the signature modes will vary a little depending on the model, the arching shape, the graduation pattern, the choice of wood, all the usual things. Formants like that bridge hill that we saw are affected by all the same things, but they're also affected by things to do with setup. In this particular case, it's affected by the adjustment of the bridge. And that chimes with something that all violin makers know. You can uh, make significant differences to the sound of an instrument by changing the bridge or cutting it a little. And that's as much as we're going to say this time. The next talk is going to fill in a gap in the story so far because I'm going to talk a bit about sound radiation and how vibrating objects like violin bodies radiate sound and what we can learn from that.